introducing Michael now at the beginning? You're introducing them all at the beginning? Um, that's what can they stuff like Mike, that's what they look like, but I'm trying to have them. Welcome back everyone. I pretty much organize a southern food session every year because I used to live in Louisiana and I love bourbon and I know there's always going to be bourbon somewhere so that's a personal strategy. Um, before, I'm trying to see if he is here. Is Doug here? Doug, Doug G. He's not here yet. All right. Oh, is that him? That's him back there. All right. I want to wish someone special a very special birthday. Doug Gutch, for you, those of you who know him, is turning 50 today, and I want to give him a huge round of applause. Woo! <laughs> Doug used to be the director of sponsorship here, and he's also, he started at the CIA 10 years ago in 2007. So this is a big year for him, and we're so happy to have him and his amazing wife, Sarah, back here on campus. So happy birthday, Doug. Thanks for spending it with us. And now I will uh, quickly move on to the Southern session and uh, introduce John T. Edge, who is our moderator. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have either seen John T. here before or know his work on Southern food. Um, he is a wonderful author. He has a book coming out in May, actually, called The Potlicker's Paper, The Potlicker Papers, A Food History of the Modern South. And I encourage you to pick that up as soon as it comes out. Uh, we'll have him back next year so he can do a signing of it. And John T. has served as director since the 1999 founding of the Southern Foodways Alliance, an institute uh, of the Center for the Study of Southern Food Culture at the University of Mississippi. And there's a whole bunch of hovering behind me, so I'm going to get out and welcome John T. <laughs> All right. Welcome. to. I'm the only person, and these nice people are the only people standing between you and cocktails. So <laughs> we'll be brief, and I hope we'll be entertaining. So I'm going to talk as I begin about kind of the broader southern renaissance which I see taking place now and we'll segue from there into food. And so my purpose now is to welcome you to the American South for the next 55 minutes. That mythical region of whole hog barbecue and hush puppies. That sprawling land that in terms of geographic size is comparable to Western Europe. This is an opportune moment to visit the American South because, as I say, I think the region is in renaissance. And, you know, the South has gone through renaissances before. Any place that's as troubled as my home region is needs renaissances once in a while. Um, our history is tragic, and our story, I think, is ultimately triumphant. Now, cultural products are kind of banners for the American South. If you think about literature and you think about the writing of William Faulkner, the Nobel laureate, or Zora Neale Hurston, the great chronicler of African American life, Hurston from Florida, Faulkner from Mississippi, those cultural products tell stories about the American South. Music is another way to think about that. Think about Louis Armstrong, the great jazz trumpeter, um, the New Orleanian. Um, think about 
say, Willie Nelson, uh, the pot-smoking, beatific, long-haired hippie from Austin, Texas, proud Southerners. Um, I also think, you know, in particular about music today coming out of the American South. We've got a slide to pop up, if y'all would. Um, and I think about a band that came out of the American South most recently. The slide's coming soon, I think, I hope. Because it's my whole line. It's going to come. It's going to come. So um, there's a band that has emerged in the last couple of years out of Alabama called the Alabama Shakes. Anybody know this band? All right. So like, I think of the Alabama Shakes as probably the best personification of the blend of rock and rhythm and blues and soul operating today. Those kind of great American musics. And the lead singer of the Alabama Shakes, Brittany Howard, um, whom you may be seeing a picture of, but if you don't, I'll illustrate it for you. Um, there she is, Brittany Howard. So think about this. Look at this picture of Brittany Howard, rock and roll musician of great strength and fervor, um, and look at her right bicep. So what do you see on her right bicep? The state of Alabama, right, tattooed on her bicep. And think about the changes in the American South recently. Think about what it means that a black woman from Alabama would claim the state enough to tattoo it on her arm. It means something, people. Um, I feel like I'm now preaching, uh, but it means something to me. Um, I think the notion that Brittany Howard claims this state, claims the state of Alabama, with such a long and tragic history, is representative of this renaissance. And there are other ways to think about that renaissance, and I think food is a great way to get at it as well. Um, and the thing I admire about the folks who are joining me on stage today, these are all people with deep roots in this region, the American South, um, and they all are crafting food, beautiful food, smart food, smartly conceived. They're also crafting narratives. So by way of their food, they're telling stories about the regions, stories that complicate the region, stories that give nuance to the region, stories that, that, that kind of bulldoze the cliches and get to some greater truth. And that's what I'm after. Um, I'll leave you one thought that is not about my proselytizing about the American South, but is about the theme of this conference, and that's casual. Um, casual comes honest in the American South um, because Southern food was born of home cooking, born of provincial cooking out of homes. And Southern food was also born of events, of harvest suppers, of moments when you're pulling in the tobacco crop and you cook a whole hog to celebrate that labor and the conclusion of that labor. Those are casual ways to gather. Those are casual prompts for meals. And I think the South has done that well and offers a lot of lessons for the nation. So the other thing to think about in terms of casual is that in a casual restaurant, there is little to no divide between the cook and the customer. It's almost like a rock and roll show or a rhythm and blues show with Brittany Howard stepping up, um, wherein she plays one note, the crowd begins to sing, everybody's humming along, and everybody's dancing. That's what we strive for in the American South is this breaking down of divides and a celebration, a full-throated celebration of the American South. So to join me in celebration, um, I have four friends um, from varying parts of the American South. Up first, you'll meet Elizabeth Carmel, um, a native of North Carolina, Greensboro specifically. Um, she, in, early in the kind of barbecue revival, Elizabeth founded something called Girls at the Grill. Um, that effort, which was an effort of women to say, we cook too, the barbe that barbecue is our craft as well, I think it was really important. Elizabeth parlayed that later um, to become the first executive chef of Hill Country Barbecue Market, um, based out of New York, um, a restaurant that interprets Hill Country Barbecue of Texas. She does that beautifully. Um, she writes a column bi-monthly for the Associated Press called The American Table, so she's a good explainer of American food culture, author of four books and another soon to come called Steak and Cake, America's Favorite Saturday Night Meal. Um, Elizabeth is going to make um, sugared and spiced pecans for us. Um, number two on our lineup is Michael Fotage, and Michael um, has deep roots in Tennessee, has a fine restaurant in Austin, Texas called Olame. 
Um, he began his career at Fino in New York City, worked at Lincoln Restaurant in Per Se with Jonathan Benno, um, cooked in L.A. with John Shook and Vinnie Dottolo at an Animal and Son of a Gun, um, and opened Olame in 2014. Um, if you go to Olame, and I suggest that's a good thing to do, um, when you go to the restroom, you will see this beautiful array um, in a little nook at the back of the photographs of the generations of women in his family, all of whom were named Olame. And I believe you have something to offer. Yeah, do it now. So I want everyone, hold on for us to, for why, but I want you um, all to give Michael a super special round of applause because he's, the, he's a CIA graduate from 2010. He's the very first CIA graduate from this kitchen right back there, very first Greystone grad to come back as a presenter. <laughs> and this is really awesome because Seven, eight years ago, he was in the kitchen as a student volunteer helping the chefs who were on the stage here. So it's really, really special that in just so few years, he's now back here on the main stage, and we're so proud of him so, and of everyone else. But, Michael, you're super special. He is special. And not like the – I don't mean like the short bus way. <laughs> um, number three is Asha Gomez. Um, who represents not one but two Souths, um, Kerala, her native region of India, and Georgia, from whence I came as well. Um, that's also the title of her fine, fine cookbook, which if you don't have, I'd recommend you descend the stairs soon after we finish and buy a copy of that. Um, in 2012, she opened a restaurant called Cardamom Hill in Atlanta. Bon Appetit named it one of the best new restaurants of that year. Today she owns Third Space, which is a culinary events facility in Atlanta. Um, her warmth and generosity shines through in her cooking, and she complicates these narratives about the American South in a, in a beautiful, beautiful way. Um, our final presenter from whom you will hear is Eli Kirstein, another Atlanta representative, um, started at the age of 16 as a cook at the Buckhead Diner underneath Kevin Rathburn, graduated from the CIA in 04, was a Top Chef Las Vegas contestant, um, and most recently a partner in the Luminary in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he's a sports fan and also a sports writer, one of these people that shifts um, in terms of what they do with their life, writes for HuffPost and SB Nation. Um, and it, his cooking will help you understand that there are a variety of ways of seeing the South, ethnicity perhaps by way of Asha's, religion by way of, um, of his contributions. It's my pleasure to welcome them all to the stage. You'll notice that we're all going to linger here and hang out with each other. We like each other. Um, and um, this is the way we would hang out around a kitchen island in our own homes. And we look forward to welcoming you into those homes over the course of the next 45 minutes. If I could, I'd ask them all to come even closer, but Anne McBride would not like that. So, hi. hi. My name is Elizabeth, and I am a smokeaholic. <laughs> Grilling, barbecue, and southern food chose me, and in return, I made it my life's work. I am a born and bred southerner. As John T. said, I'm a very proud North Carolinian. I no longer live in North Carolina, but North Carolina is here in my heart. And those of you who are from the South or who have friends who are from the South know that Southerners love to tell stories, right? John T. just told four stories, right? Our stories. And in the South, our recipes are our best stories in my mind. Our recipes are our most precious heirlooms. They're our, our heritage. And, um, and that's how I cook. I am a big Francophile. I went to school in Paris and was absolutely infatuated with all things French. But when I got a little bit older and when I came home, I absolutely could not not cook French southern food. I mean, that is, that's really where my heart is and where my passion lies. Um, to me, an outdoor grill is just 
a heat source. It's a way to cook food. I can cook absolutely anything on a grill. Um, I have a motto, it's if you can eat it, you can grill it. Um, because anyone who knows anything about grilling knows that you can either have a direct high heat or an indirect heat. So the recipe that I'm making for you today, I'm going to do in the oven, and I mostly do it in the oven, but I could if I had to do it um, on a grill. And when I first started um, in this business, uh, believe it or not, about 20 years ago, Weber Grill was my client. And um, I actually created uh, a custom class here at Greystone in 1998 that was before the first World of Flavor Conference. And I brought journalists out here and taught them how to grill. And, um, and so I'm thrilled to be here because to me, in 19 years, I've seen how grilling and, uh, has really changed in, in America. And then barbecue. So back then, I used to say I grilled for a living and I barbecued um, for fun because growing up in North Carolina, of course, I loved barbecue. I, I grew up on barbecue, but then I moved away from North Carolina and it took me moving away from North Carolina to really appreciate North Carolina style barbecue because what happened was I moved away, I actually moved to New Orleans and um, I missed that barbecue, and I realized I was going to have to learn how to make it myself if I was going to have it more than once or twice a year um, when I went home. So fast forward, I'm working with Weber. It totally changes my life. I decide that grilling and barbecue is going to be um, my life's work. I go all over the barbecue belt, and I learn everything I can about every other region's barbecue, and then seven years after Weber Grilling Institute at Greystone, I started creating Hill Country Barbecue Market. And Hill Country Barbecue Market is in New York City. Ann McBride said, be sure you talk about how it is to take southern food outside of the south. Um, so I'll get there in, in the minute, but um, I created as the executive chef all of the food. Um, my motto was, come for the meat and stay for the sides and the dessert. So the reason I bring that up is because I think it's a very, very important in a restaurant to have one person's point of view. Not every restaurant, but the kind of restaurant that I was trying to create. And what I was trying to create was a restaurant that would be transportive. So that, that would be, mean that there's a huge expat community in New York City of Southerners, right? So if you were a little homesick, and you were from the South, and you lived in Manhattan, or you were visiting Manhattan, you could come to Hill Country and feel at home, and get a taste of home. And as a North Carolinian, I was so, I really wanted to make sure that anyone from Texas didn't come in and say, ah, oh, this isn't really Texas. So I brought in Big Red Soda. Does anyone know what Big Red Soda is? Brought it in FedEx. Bluebell ice cream, brought it in FedEx on dry ice. Didn't matter for those little things how much it cost. Hill Country was the very first person to serve Tito's vodka um, in New York City. And we also were the very first restaurant to get um, Shinerbach. Uh, you know, the line, the, the draft Shinerbach. There were people who were bringing it in illegally, but we didn't do that. So, um, so anyway, it was super important to me when you walked through the door that it, was, that it transported you to your grandmother's table. And like John T. said, um, all of my food started at my grandmother's table. And at Hill Country, it was, on an average day, I would serve a 1,000 people. But what I wanted to make sure is every single recipe tasted like, you know, someone you love was giving you a hug when you took a bite, right? And that was all rooted in the food that I grew up with. But also authentic, you know, with a nod to Texas. So, for example, my very popular white shoe peg corn pudding at Hill Country, um, my mother helped me with it when I was creating the recipes for the restaurant, but I added just a little cayenne pepper to give it a little heat because in Texas, people like things a little bit hotter than they do um, in North Carolina. So that was sort of my philosophy on, you know, how to create the food, and I did that with everything. Well. So, you know, a restaurant is also a business, right? 
and um, your, uh, your, your food cost is really important. And John T is going to have to nudge me because I'm, am I talking too long? Oh, okay, okay, all right. So food cost is super important. And one day we're looking at all of the, um, the P&Ls and everything, and um, there are a lot of pecans in a lot of my recipes. And pecans are super expensive. Um, but as a southern cook, I use pecans like other cooks use salt and pepper. So here's the truth. We never took a pecan out of anything. But what happened is I called some farmers in Texas, and it was half the cost to ship those pecans from Texas to New York City than it was for me to buy them from my purveyor in New York City. So, if, you know, think about that if you want to use pecans, you know. <laughs> Um, so I know I'm supposed to. I know I'm supposed to demo this recipe for you. Um, I want to tell you this is one of my favorite recipes. Not only would I serve it um, in the restaurant, I make it at home all the time. I always have a mason jar on hand. So if I need to bring a gift to somebody, this is my homemade hostess gift, food gift. It's also the best little nibble to go with a little libation, which. For me, it's usually a little bit of brown water, um, and, uh, and it's just a great thing to have on hand. But did anyone eat the sweet potato bourbon mash at lunch? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But that sweet potato bourbon mash was um, topped with, I called them, praline pecans. So by any other name, this is, this is sweet and spicy. That's how I created it, because I can't quite get away from barbecue. So there's some cumin, there's some cayenne pepper, as well as the cinnamon. But I'm going to show you just how easy it is to make it. Um, one of the things that's really important to me is um, I love French cooking, right, going back to, to France. Um, I love the layers of flavor that you get with French cooking. Uh, and um, I do not like using gratuitous fats. So sometimes Southern cooking gets a really bad rap, right? It's like fat, fat, more fat. Actually, Southern cooking is as fresh as you can get. It's just the flavor profile's not Mediterranean, right? You don't, you don't need a lot of fat. You just need a little bit of fat. But growing up in the South, lots of people make candied pecans. I never liked the candied pecans I had because either they were made on the stovetop or in the oven, too greasy, too hard, something like that. So I experimented one day and I realized a little bit of water and a little egg white could be actually what would adhere the salt, the pepper, and the spices. Um, I'm a fork cook, so that's why I'm doing this with a fork. Uh, who else out there is a fork cook? I kind of think it's a southern thing. My mother is a fork cook. My grandmother was a fork cook. So um, you just get a little bit of froth on that, and then... You just stir them around just to, so they get a little bit wet. And I'm going to pass a jar of these around. If you didn't get to try them at lunch, you should try one. Um, yeah, that would be great. Let's get a full one. We actually have a, don't we have a bag back there too of extra ones? Yeah, just let, every, I mean, just please take one so everybody can, okay, do as many as you want. One of these is for Asha, so I promised her a jar. Um, anyway, so I, I've, got them, I've got them wet from the um, egg white and the water. You cannot just use water um, because what will happen is it will melt the sugar and um, you'll just get a really soupy sort of caramel mess. Uh, and not caramel in the best way. So, and then it's just... Brown sugar, about a third of a cup of brown sugar, two-thirds of a cup of white sugar. I like to add cumin. If you don't like cumin, you don't have to put it in. Teaspoon of salt. Ooh, that got wet, huh? So um, cinnamon. you got to have cinnamon, right? And a pinch of cayenne, a nice, nice little pinch of cayenne. And that's it. So you just stir that around. And this, this recipe is so, so deceiving because I've hardly cooked, right? I mean, this could be an arts and crafts project. Um, <laughs> except, except it doesn't taste like an arts and crafts project. How does that taste? Anybody take, you like them? Um, and 
one, one year, uh, New York Magazine asked me for a homemade Christmas gift recipe, and so I gave them this because I literally make these all the time. I get a pretty ceramic bowl, they get a jar of that, they get a ceramic bowl to put it in, and boom, bingo, that's a gift. And um, so I gave the, the editor, the food editor, who's from England originally, this recipe, and she's like, oh, ho-hum, da-da-da-da, this is not going to be very good, Elizabeth. And I said, well, just try it, just make it. So anyway, she made them, and it was the lead recipe of the Christmas um, issue, and to this day, she makes them over and over again. So it's kind of one of those deceptive things. So you just want to stir it until all of the pecans have a nice um, little crust on them. And the longer you let it sit, sometimes I let it sit in a bowl um, for a little while, then they get, they get kind of encased in the sugar and the spices. Um, if you like other spices, you can change them up. And then you just put them on a sill pack. So me demoing this recipe has not addressed what I think the new casual is. Um, and I want to I wanna say I think that the best thing about the new casual, and a few years after Hill Country Barbecue Market, I created a fried chicken and pie restaurant that was a classic and still is a classic fast casual restaurant. Um, but either one, it's a chance for people to slow down. We live such a fast paced life that to me the new casual is slow down, go someplace that has good food, good service, um, to me, the best possible ingredients. I don't want to skimp on my ingredients just because it's casual. And I mean, whether I'm a diner or whether I'm a cook. And, um, and just relax and enjoy each other's company. Because the thing about food is, and I learned this growing up, I sort of passed over my personal heritage besides the North Carolina part. But my, both my parents were psychologists, college professors, and writers. Um, but the way that we communicated our love for each other in our family was through food. And that really made a huge impact on me. And I really do believe, down to the core of my being, that the best way to communicate is through food. And um, I think the opportunity out there for the new casual is really, is really to do this. It doesn't matter what genre it is, whether it's southern food or Italian food or, you know, sweet greens, lettuce. I mean, if you go to sweet greens, has anybody been to a sweet greens? You go there, don't you feel the love? I mean, it's vegetable love. It's a little different from pecan love or bacon love, but I mean, you feel the love. Like, you're excited when you go there. I mean, have you been to one? Okay. Anyway, I'm excited when I go there. I feel like somebody has washed those vegetables and they've you know, they've tried to source it well and that, you know, if I'm in the mood for a salad that, you know, I'm, I'm getting that. And then finally, the very last thing I'm gonna, gonna say, unless you want me to address anything else, is that um, people always ask me, what's the difference between, you know, good barbecue and great barbecue? And barbecue really is an art. I mean, if anybody was in my class this morning, you see, taming the flame is an art. It's different every single time you do it. But the real difference between good barbecue and great barbecue is feeling the love. Each piece of meat that you cook is different. And you really have to, you can't approach it you know, with a time watch or whatever. You really have to feel it, commune with it, and, and then it's delicious. And that's why this business, it's a hard, hard business if you're in barbecue. But it is so rewarding because, you know, every time you see a perfect brisket or a perfect rack of ribs or a whole hog, um, you know, I get excited. I've seen hundreds of thousands of them, but every single time I, I see it, I get excited. And the one thing I didn't talk about that Ann wanted me to talk about, so if you email me, I'd be happy to talk to you on the phone about, is two years ago I started an online barbecue shack because barbecue has become such you know, it's a hobby, it's a vacation destination, it's so much more than just something that you eat. And it's very rare for people to be able to get a taste of whole hog barbecue. So I started an online barbecue shack and I literally sell barbecue by the pound 
anywhere in the United States. And it's called Carolina Q, and in North Carolina, Q is spelled C-U-E, so carolinaq2go.com. And if you um, look at it or write me, I'll be more than happy um, to write you back or tell you about that business model, which is very, very different. So this is what they look like when they come out of the oven. <laughs> you, I think you have the recipes in your packet, but you bake them at 300 degrees for about 30 minutes, and then you let them cool. You have to let them cool because otherwise they won't candy. And my favorite thing to do is to roll up the silpat and then, whoops. See? Perfect. All right. So that's me. You make, you make me think, too, about Elizabeth Flower talking about Danny Meyer's new restaurant or new iteration of Union Square Cafe and the to-go um, space just at the adjacent to it. And this kind of casual thing that awaits your next cocktail party sitting on your bar um, is a great example of what's possible with casual, too. Hi, y'all. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and, and thanks for and thanks for the nice words. Uh, it's a bit overwhelming, uh, but wonderful and uh, pretty exciting. I want to um, talk to you about my deviled egg, the genesis for the deviled egg, uh, how it affects kind of or is an interpretation of what I do um, at the restaurant, Olame. Um, and I'm going to kind of enlist my friend John T., to kind of have a, a conversation with me um, around this stuff, um, I find that um, when we talk, it really is a, it's really a pleasure for me to discuss these ideas, and I'm hopeful that you guys can enjoy it as well. Um, as far as a demo, um, you know, I imagine that most of you are familiar with deviled eggs. Um, and there's really not a whole lot of difference between this deviled egg and a deviled egg uh, that, that we are all so familiar with. Um, the restaurant, uh, like John T. said, is, is based off of um, my childhood with uh, my mother and my grandmother, uh, Ola May. And every meal that was special, or even when somebody had come back to town or something like that, we would we would have deviled eggs and pickled okra on the table. And it was, it, it never changed. That was always something there. And they were known as like my two favorite things. Um, and what's funny is my mother is from Tennessee. Um, I grew up in Dallas. Um, I feel like the deviled egg came with my mother from Tennessee in her childhood. And the pickled okra was picked up somewhere along the way um, from Taco, Texas. Um, out in San Angelo, um, which is like far north, uh, northwest central Texas. And I think uh, one of the best pickles there is in the world. And I chose uh, I, to consider the idea of casual nature in a restaurant, uh, especially my restaurant. Um, when I opened the restaurant, I wanted to do something that was fine dining, but no white tablecloth, so that the food felt thoughtful and elevated, but at the same time uh, was approachable and felt like you hit these touchstones from child, from my childhood or, or your childhood. And uh, through that process, uh, we had a lot of good success, but we realized we have this like beautiful porch um, on, the, on the exterior of the restaurant. And I took on this idea of rolling out a porch menu. Um, and these are ideas that are a little bit more simple than what I offer in the dining room, um, a little bit more approachable, a little cheaper, um, using the same quality ingredients um, that I use. And on that menu, to discuss the okra and the, and the egg, um, I serve Talk of Texas pickled okra. I don't make okra. I don't mess with it. I, serve, I make an okra remoulade with the Talk of Texas okra, but I don't, I don't mess with it because you know, I did work for John and Vinny, and they have a, a cookbook uh, that came out a few years ago. And in the book, it says, um, if you can't make it better than the folks making it, then don't try to make it better. And, and I feel like, you know, okra is uh, ubiquitous in Texas, especially, you know, 
Um, those of us who work out of uh, Central Texas farmers markets will tell you there's a period of the year where all you can get is okra, peppers, and eggplant. That's it. Um, but that being said, finding consistently okra that's not woody or is the appropriate size um, is pretty challenging. So I stick with Talks to Texas because it's also a touchstone for me and really uh, something important for me and, and something that I share at every table um, as a host. Um, the egg itself is a, is a little bit different idea. So I, was, I spent all this time trying to think about, you know, how do I, how do I take my mom's egg and, and make it mine uh, and, and represent kind of what, what, I, what we're about at the restaurant and also keep it fun. Um, and we like mustard deviled eggs. That's, that's what my family is into. Um, there's never been a ton of mayo in our deviled egg. Um, and so, you know, I kind of started from there. Um, because Olame is a little bit technique intensive, the idea that I had was that, okay, let's, you know, how do you take a deviled egg and elevate just a little bit? So um, some of you who were in the, in the uh, barrel room earlier probably may have tried the egg. And, and the difference being, you know, I've circulated the egg yolk. So I've taken the egg yolks um, separated from separated them from the whites and put them in a 67 degree Celsius uh, water bath for an hour. Um, and I came on this technique by doing other dishes and, and using egg yolks as thickeners and kind of fiddling around with stuff like that. And it occurred to me this would work really well there. Um, and then, you know, and then I just devil those yolks. Um, as well, along the way, I'm reading um, our friend Ashley Christensen's book. Um, and she does a wonderful deviled egg as well. And she uh, kicks a little knowledge to us and says she likes to use butter. So, I mean, what goes better in a vacuum sealed bag with egg yolks than butter? I don't, I can't think of anything. So, um, so the butter goes in the bag and it's dropped in the, in the circulated water bath for an hour and it comes out and we cool it. And then we marry it with some, uh, a little bit of mayonnaise a little, and a lot of mustard. Um, and then it's passed through a chinois or, or a tammy so that it has, you know, you break up any clumps, you have some nice texture. Um, and what you get out of that egg yolk is a really nice, round, um, you know, some people would call it a sexy mouthfeel. Um, it really uh, kind of hits all those notes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, and, and, and something that I, I think is uh, really reminiscent of what my childhood uh, touchstone is, but as well something that like is kind of a little bit technique intensive and or a little bit of technique that adds uh, effect that, that is really nice. Um, as well, um, with the idea of mustard being an important part of this deviled egg, we I, I uh, chose to use uh, pickled mustard seeds, um, which is just a you know it's a classic technique. It's vinegar and water and sugar uh, with and, and for this application, I add celery seed. So it's white mustard seeds, or yellow mustard seeds, sorry, and, and celery seeds that have been pickled together. Um, and they're dropped into the egg, and I'll assemble it here in a, little, in a minute. Uh, but they're dropped into the egg to add some texture, um, as well as like, you know, this pop of mustard. So I, uh, here, we'll make one. And then we can kind of talk about uh, the casual nature of where we're headed. So the, the other thing that's a, that's a little bit different is this egg, um, as you can see, it's, it's one per. It's one deviled egg per egg. Here, let me put it down so it's easier for everybody to. Um, you would think that this is an obnoxious thing to do from a food waste perspective. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not because I have an outlet for it. I make egg salad um, uh, that we sell at lunchtime. So um, all of the trim that comes out of this egg, the the hard boil, the yolk, and the uh, or most of the yolk, and the remaining whites are incorporated into an egg salad that is an egg salad salad. Um, so uh, we can all rest assured I'm not wasting a bunch of great work and money. Um, it also creates something unique and interesting that you, you don't see a lot of uh, single egg, egg, deviled eggs. 
Um, and that was another thing that was very important to me was to represent it in a way that would be thoughtful and different from what people uh, have really uh, grown accustomed to. So the pickled mustard seed and celery, um, as you can see, is a pretty tight uh, mixture. It doesn't have a lot of liquid to it. Uh, we drop the mustard seed and celery seed into the into the egg itself, and then we take this, we pipe in or uh, squeezy in um, the egg yolk mixture. It's important. Um, and then, you know, we take some of the reserved egg yolk from from the hard boil, and we mix it with a little bit of chopped chive. And it dresses the egg like that. Uh, at home, uh, I work with this farm. Uh, at Olamay, we work with uh, all Central Texas produce. Um, I'm the, I guess I am the produce company that provides the restaurant. Uh, I spend my Wednesdays and Saturdays driving to two urban farms and then a downtown farmer's market. Uh, and there's a farm within city limits in Austin called Springdale Farm. And Glenn, the farmer, is a close friend. He makes this incredible Springdale smoke pepper mix. And so he grows these peppers and then he smokes them in his smoker on the farm and then he grinds it up and we buy it and it's just spectacular stuff. So it gets a little bit of Springdale smoke pepper mix. And that's really it. Um, you know, to me, it's kind of, this is kind of a representation of me. Uh, it's a little bit of my background in kind of modern restaurant operation and uh, a little bit of the southern soul that I have that is like kind of, kind of can't be churched up. I was having a conversation recently with Francis Lamb, and I mentioned Slug Burger that we also have on this porch menu. And a Slug Burger, I don't know if uh, y'all are familiar, I, I learned about a Slug Burger for the first time two years ago at the Southern Foodways Symposi Alliance Symposium in Oxford in October um, with this awesome uh, documentary piece about Slug Burgers and, and their place in our, in our food culture. It's, uh, it's a... It has no slugs in it. Which <laughs> would be so much more whiz bang, wouldn't it? Uh, but uh, it's it's it, there's several different recipes, but basically it's pork or beef trim um, combined most of the time with either soybean or uh, bread trim. Uh, and I just fell in love with this idea of of making a slug burger and putting it on my on my menu and wondering if people how many people are going to ask me if there were slugs in it and and lo and behold people have really responded to it um, Francis Francis accused me of of churching up a slug burger and that that's not something that I should be doing <laughs> but I think um, I think that the idea of you know taking these items that are you know um, part of our food culture and and I am hopeful that because I have fed somebody a slug burger that they will when they're traveling through Mississippi that they will stop and they will eat the real thing and they will enjoy it just as much as 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 my slug burger and understand that you know there's significance across the board and that uh, just because it's made with you know, free range beef and house made. Sometimes I put biscuit, biscuit, uh, uh, you know, hours old biscuit dough or into the uh, into the slug burger as well. Um, just because it's made with all this stuff that's really nice and and uh, curated very intensely, that it that it can also be really important just the way it comes. Um, and I think that you know, to me, I guess that's kind of my interpretation of being casual. You know, taking this idea of food that that ha that has touched me in some way, or an idea that has touched me in some way, and representing it um, from my perspective, um, and maybe using you know some ideas that aren't from a casual background in order to help me make that point. 
um, which I think is is certainly using an emergent circulator. Um, I don't think that I don't think that the slug burger makers of Mississippi uh, really really have seen many of those. So that could be. But um, so I don't know. What do you think? I think you hit on a great concept early in your comments when you talked about porch food. And you talk, it's almost like porch cuisine. I think about an earlier comment um, from yesterday about fine casual. You know, we're coining new terms now, but I think if you, if you think about southern food and you think about the environment in which you would serve something like a deviled egg, calling this porch food is very much a part of this. The porch is the place where you welcome people. The porch is the place where you are relaxed in the American South. The porch is a place you kind of while away an afternoon, and this is that kind of food. This is a food of welcome, um, and it's also a food of without pretense. And you've elevated it, you, you've honored it, but it's still porch food. And, and your porch at it, your restaurant is a very inviting place. Well, good. Yeah, I feel that way. <laughs> But you know, I appreciate that, and, and I and I think you're right. I think you know, and and also to kind of speak to a little bit more of that idea as well. You know, my hope is that people who or or folks or or guests or diners that may not uh, want to commit to an experience inside of the OMA dining room, which um, is, you know, uh, a, a What's your average check inside the dining room? Seventy-five dollars a head. Seventy-five dollars. So, and then, and yet you can. And I've done it before. I, I was in Austin for three days. I went there the first afternoon and had drinks on the porch. Came back the next afternoon and had drinks on the porch and had biscuits and deviled eggs and this kind of porch food. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's a great place to for an, a kind of economical entree to your cuisine. Yeah, and, and that was the idea. It's like, okay, let's do some food that is a little bit. Uh, cheaper, but also, you know, let's let's give them some gimmies. Let's give them a deviled egg that right. that they know, and let's present it in a way that makes them feel like, oh, okay, maybe what's going on in there is something like this, and I can get there. I, I remember when Fig, the great Charleston restaurant, Mike Lotto's restaurant, first opened. Um, you would go in there for a cocktail, and they w when you ordered a drink, this you know, and, and if you smiled nice and acted right then the bartender would reach down beneath the bar and magically reappear with a deviled egg. You know, it was a great symbol of hospitality and it was an enticement to stay. Like you bought the cocktail, the deviled egg, and the next step you were sitting down in the banquette and spending two hundred dollars that night. It was a beautiful That is so cool. Beautiful welcome. Yeah. That's awesome. And and you know, I think my father told me this recently that that if you give somebody something free, then they're what, seventy seventy percent more likely to spend more money. I believe that. You know. Guilt's a great motivator. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. This is like super cool and, and a real treat. <laughs> yeah. Now comes Asha Gomez. My name is Asha Gomez. I am a first generation immigrant chef. I come from another south oceans and continents across from a state called Kerala on the southern tip of India. Um, <clears throat> very pristinely beautiful place, kind of nestled between the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. Um, I grew up in a fishing community. Um, my last name is Gomez. I was raised Roman Catholic. <laughs> All the things that people, when they think Indian, do not associate with. Um, and my mother's kitchen, um, we did not eat tandoori chicken or naan or palak paneer, the iconic Indian dishes that I think uh, the American palate is accustomed to. Um, it was a very different type of cuisine that I grew up with. I have been fortunate enough to call the American South home for over two decades now. and. My story really is just the immigrant experience. You know, I stand on the shoulders of so many immigrant chefs and immigrants whose stories um, were really never told, whose lives uh, and cuisine have left an indelible imprint on the America that I live in, work in, love in, 
And so um, it's very special that I get to tell my story um, through food. Because what better way is there to tell a story of our connective, um, connectedness that we have but through food? Um, these two sats that I've called home have so much in common. Um, maybe it's because it's, these regions are closer to the equator belt. They grow the same kinds of produce. The tons of port cities in both my souths. I grew up in a port city. And then you think of port cities like Charleston and Savannah and all the external influences that happen in that region. Um, the place that I called home, our predominant um, crop there, our spice there was black pepper. So, you know, from the time of the Roman Empire, people have been coming to those shores. And with the influence of trade and all these external influences, it changes you know, the way um, that that particular region um, eats. The cuisine changes. It evolves over a, t a period of time. For us, we had Portuguese, Dutch, French, Chinese influences, till of course the British came and then decided to stay for a couple of hundred years <laughs> before they left. But, um, they did leave us with some things. They unified us as a nation. We're one of the largest democracies in the world there in India. Um, they gave us tea. And I believe they gave us the language English that we have, um, that we speak all through it, through India. Um, <clears throat> but when I started cooking, what I realized was just the synergy that existed in these two regions, right? I grew up in a region where the predominant crop is rice. And here in the American South, there's just such an abundance of rice. Um, because of the Portuguese influence in the region that I grew up in, um, they gave us the gift of the pig. And it's one of the few regions in India that actually celebrates pork in its cuisine. I found that in common with the American South. Um, fried chicken, which I'm going to demo today. Um, the assumption always when I make this dish from the time I opened my restaurant was that this is probably, my fried chicken is probably my Southern American influence. And um, that's how this recipe came about. But this is actually a recipe that I grew up eating in the Indian South in my mother's kitchen for, she's been making this for decades now. I think every culture figured out that if you drenched the bird in flour and deep fried it, it was probably going to be good. Um, so I think every culture has a fried bird. So my fried bird um, is, it, it's very herbaceous. <clears throat> so we have, we, the, the brine for it is buttermilk, ginger, garlic, serrano green chilies, mint, and cilantro that gets blended up together with some salt. <clears throat> and then the chicken, I only use boneless, skinless thighs. I don't know what it is, but for me, uh, <laughs> when I'm eating fried chicken, I want some red meat. Um, and it really needs to sit in the brine for at least a good 20 to 24 hours. Um, and the more it sits, the better it gets. So. I'm just going to start this off and show you, and we'll talk as we go. So I'm going to put my buttermilk in there. And that's another thing, right? Buttermilk is big in the south here, isn't it? Lots of garlic. My chicken is very garlic forward. Ginger. I'm going to do about two serrano chilies in there. All of the cilantro, stems and all. Mint. A nice generous portion of salt. We're going to blend that all up, if I can get it started. This is plugged in. Carol, would it be yogurt? 
It would actually no. It would be buttermilk. It would be buttermilk. Yes. And if my mom was serving this dish, it would be served over a dish of rice pilaf of some sort. When I started serving it, I researched a low country waffle that was made with cooked rice, and so I serve it with a low country waffle and um, a spiced cane syrup. You know, I didn't realize, I don't know if you know this, John T, but the first time you had this chicken and um, I served you the chicken, you asked me what the syrup was and I said, well, it's jaggery, right? Uh, in my mother's kitchen, there was always a block of jaggery. Jaggery essentially is uh, sugar cane, as soon as it's juiced, you cook it down. When it cools down, it condenses. It forms this block, almost like uh, Parmesan. And when she needed to sweeten something, she would shave it, melt it down, and it would be used as a sweetener. And I didn't realize till Jaunty pointed it out, and then you sent me some cane syrup. And so essentially, jaggery melted down is cane syrup, and it's that sweetener, another thing that these two places had in common. I just happened to, um, uh, for my um, cane syrup, I chose some cumin, some crushed chili flakes, and some whole coriander, and that's what the sauce is. So we do the chicken on a low country waffle, and we finished it with the spiced um, cane syrup. So once you do that, then you marinate it, for 24 hours. Um, it really can go on the grill too, but who wants to do that? We want some fried chicken. <clears throat> so you just dredge it with flour. I should turn this on. I think, do, does everybody get to eat this tomorrow morning? Is that what it is? Do our recipes, um, Yes. Lunchtime tomorrow, you get this. Yes. You get to eat the Kerala fried chicken. Yeah. So in my mother's kitchen, if she was frying this up, because the other crop that is very common in Kerala is coconut, and so we really cook predominantly with coconut oil, she would actually fry this in coconut oil. Here, I just fry it in a regular vegetable oil, but then I finish it with coconut oil. So usually when it comes out of the fryer, I do a drizzle of the coconut oil, flash fry some curry leaves, add some uh, garam masala and chili powder to it, and that's how we serve it. John T., I want you to ask me something. Okay, I'll be happy to ask you something. <laughs> So, so your food, when you opened Cardamom Hill, um, that restaurant struck me because like what Michael described, this is a restaurant that showcased great technique, but was intentionally a casual restaurant. Um, but it became a place of pilgrimage. It became a place people were excited to go to. Um, is that in conflict, the notion that your restaurant became a place of pilgrimage, some place that that they made special tri special arrangements to go to as opposed to a place they'd go you know, once a week. It was a regular stop. I mean, is there a conflict between the two? Uh, I, I believe so, there was. Um, the other thing is, on that note, before I answer the question that you said, um, a lot of people, I think, make the assumption that my food is fusion food. And um, I really don't like that word. I always say it's the other F word for me. Um, it, it, my food is not fusion. My food is um, an evolution of who I am as a person, these amazing places I've been fortunate enough to call home, uh, my two souths, um, the fact that I'm a home cook, I'm a chef, I'm a mother. That evolution that has been happening from the beginning of time when it comes to food, um, that is not fusion. That's just evolution. I'm just a speck in this unending evolution of cuisine that happens, not just in the South, but I think around the world, when you think of global cuisine, um, when external influences come into a particular region and somehow their stories um, and their lives and their cuisine become such an integral part of this new place that you call home, right? Um, to me, that is 
the most beautiful part of my immigrant experience is that when Ethan, I have an 11-year-old son, um, 10 years from now when he's in his kitchen making a buttermilk biscuit and he decides to put talisheri black pepper in it or he's making cornbread and he decides to put cardamom in it, it's not so out of the norm anymore. It's become part of the landscape. And um, what so many immigrant chefs bring to the table um, that you know changes, I think for the better, any one given region. And I think that's happening so much in the South um, today with all of you chefs. My fellow chefs, I know how much they embrace the spices that I cook with, um, the techniques that I cook with. Um, it's, it's really special to see how they take it into their kitchen, make it their own, and then it just becomes part of this new American landscape. That, um, what do you feel about the new American South? I, I think it's an honest expression of the people who live there, and I, and I, like you, don't like the term fusion, especially when it's a term of denigration applied to someone who is, you know, you live in this modern South, and a city like Atlanta is a true multicultural salad bowl of peoples. Yes. It's, it's not um, some place that looks to, Lord help us, the Confederacy for its keynotes. You know, this yes. is... This is a very dynamic city, and to cook the way you do is honest. It's nothing about fusion. It's about looking around at your city and saying, you know, you know this is the, this is the, the Mexican-American grocery store where I shop, and this is the, the Thai friend I've made, and my food reflects the, food, the dishes I borrow from those cultures. And also using, you know, sustainability, using ingredients that I didn't grow up with. Like, I didn't grow up eating a peach, but... It's in my backyard, and so I'm going to make a peach chutney, and it's going to scream my mother's kitchen. Um, so taking those local ingredients and incorporating them into the cuisine that I grew up with as well is a huge part of how I cook. You made a comment a moment ago about being a home cook, being a mother, and that seems to me also at the root of the casual nature of your, of your food, the so. welcome of your food. Talk a little bit about that and how that plays out. Um, you know, for me, the kinship that I found with the American South was that hospitality, that sitting around the table, that communing. Like I said, I come from a region that's, I was raised Roman Catholic, so you went to mass and then you had Sunday supper, you sat around the table. Um, it didn't matter what socioeconomic um, um, structure you came from, that was just something you did as right. community. You sat around a table, and that feeling of um, being able to sit around a table and share a meal with family, with friends, and sometimes with strangers. You could sit with a stranger for 10 minutes, commune over a meal, and you leave as friends, right? Um, there's something very homely about that, and I think that's where the casualness comes in. It's that sense of home, because you're never sitting stiff when you're sitting at home, you're as relaxed right. as you possibly can be, so yes. There's a sense of bounty to home, and in a previous panel I was talking to J.J. Johnson, the chef yes. at Minton's um, up in Harlem, New York City, and he was talking about the idea of family style service as a trend he sees coming. Um, you see it at restaurant like um, uh, um, oh, State Bird and Stewart and Stewart's Restaurant in San Francisco. It's this beautiful. notion of sharing at the table, it brings people together, but it's also efficient in this moment of high labor costs, too. Yeah, and, and so then the idea of communal tables, right? right? Where 10 people who don't know each other sit around the table, communal or something they have in common that they really enjoy, and they leave as friends. It's really special. That's what we do at the third space. It's mostly family style dining, but um, we encourage people to lean over, say hello, you know, exchange stories, talk about the experience, so yes. So there's a little bit of social engineering in your restaurant experience. Yes. So that's my food, that's how I cook, my two souths. Um, it's an Indian sensibility in a southern kitchen. People always ask me, um, so do you love eating curry? And I'm like, no, when I wake up in the morning, 
I want to eat a buttermilk biscuit smothered in sausage gravy <laughs> because my sensibility is as American as apple pie because I've called this place home a lot longer than I've called the Indian South home. On behalf of the South, we're glad you claimed us. Thank you. We'll be serving this in the marketplace tomorrow, so come get some. Thank you, Asha. It's all yours, Eli. Bring them home. So, my name is Eli Kirsten. I'm from Atlanta. Um, I grew up in probably the least denominational home you could grow up in to the fact that my parents even took it to a Unitarian church. So you can't be any less religious than that. Uh, so my mom was a uh, Southern Presbyterian and, uh, you know, so deep blooded in the South that I had family members that helped found Cordelia, Georgia and all this real deep Southern stuff. And my father was a Jewish guy born in Philadelphia, but grew up in Huntsville because my grandfather worked um, for NASA, which is the only reason at that time to be a Jew in Huntsville, if we're being honest. <laughs> By the way, he told me I could only do like four Jew jokes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, 14, 14, okay. Um, so, so, you know, when my um, paternal grandmother passed away when I was about eight or nine years old, sort of my Jewish identity kind of went away. You know, we always did the high holidays. We always did Passover seders. We always did Hanukkah and those things. And we would still do, you know, Hanukkah, like the candles, but we didn't really do much, much more than that. You know, we always had the Christmas tree. We always did Easter. But that kind of part of my identity sort of disappeared and um, I kind of settled into a little bit more of a traditional you know southern uh, you know kind of kind of family you know we were eating overcooked green beans which are still my favorite kind of green beans um, and things like that and so a little bit later in my life um, you know I went on this thing called birthright uh, where they send you know Jewish and Jewish youth to uh, Israel and so I came back and I kind of got re-inspired to kind of refine my Jewish identity and when I started kind of digging into it a little bit I got very excited about the, the history and the bloodline of Jews in the South. Um, at the turn of the century into the 1900s, there were more Jews in Charleston, South Carolina than any other city in America. Um, the oldest, second oldest synagogue in America is in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and I found that there's this deep blood of the Jews being in the South. Um, I was even finding that, you know, come the, the 20s and 30s, the, uh, about a third of all brisket consumption in the South was by Jewish families. So I found that to be this really staggering kind of statistic. And um, so as a cook, I started kind of getting more excited about that every day. And, um, and I found that there's just this really, really deep, rich Jewish heritage in the South, and it's always been influenced. It's always been, for the most part, very welcomed. Um, and, and a lot of the more traditional Jewish dishes, I found fold into Southern food really well. Um, so one thing that we always eat on Passover is brisket. And I kind of wanted to re-envision it, kind of think of something that felt a little more comfortable to me and more familiar to me than just a boiled brisket kind of thing. Because I didn't eat it much, you know, when I was when I was younger. So I kind of got into um, cotton, kind of got into the world of the idea of like smoking and barbecuing a brisket for a long period of time. So I don't know who was walking around the front of the market the last couple of days, but you probably saw that 20 foot smoker that was out there. So they rented that for me to cook a brisket which I thought was aggressive, but I'm really appreciative of that. <laughs> um, so, so I basically took what, I, what it become my Passover meal and turned it into a composed plate, but also something that I think is still really casual and comfortable for people. So I take a brisket, um, we smoke it for about 12 hours, we rub it down with equal parts, mustard, prepared horseradish, and brown sugar, let that all caramelize up. Um, I just wrap this in foil so I can reheat it today. We end up with like this big, gnarly, sticky, bark looking guy. You guys could probably see that up there. Um, so to me, that was exciting. I was like, I can take something that a lot of people consider overcooked, hammered Jewish pot roast and turn it into that. So I felt like I achieved something with that. So one of the other things uh, that you always have at a Passover dinner is um, something called harosa. Has anybody been to a Passover Seder? Anybody? OK, cool. All right, I'm not alone here. Uh, <laughs> Was a, that was a half. That was a half one. Um, and what I realized is, you know, Haroso is a, re is a really cool 
dish because it's basically a condiment for just about anything. You know, you have apples, you have nuts, you have honey, all this stuff mixed together. This is something that if you put it on a cheese platter would not be out of place. Um, so I always usually like to get, you know, local, local Georgia apples uh, or pears for this. Um, I have apples today. We actually, um, I have walnuts today, but I usually get, once again, Georgia pecans because it works in this just as well. Um, dehydrated fruit. Um, I've used everything from apricots to dehydrated strawberries to, in this case, golden raisins. Um, raw red wine. You don't cook it out. You don't do anything. You just put it right on top. Um, some honey. A little bit of lemon juice. And some cinnamon. So when you do this, uh, I like to mix it and let it sit for several hours. It kind of starts to pull the juices out. But, you know, it's one of those things. It's a staple of a Seder plate. And it still has this great deliciousness to it autonomously. It's not just eating gefilte fish and things like that. And when you're able to use strictly local ingredients and kind of recreate it, I think that's kind of like exciting. It's something that my family have been making for, you know, probably three or 4,000 years, and I was able to do things from right by me and kind of recreate that. Um, so I always make that, put that aside. So then uh, I like to serve it with latkes. Um, I know latkes are kind of a, kind of a, um, let me see if I get this thing to light, uh, kind of a um, Hanukkah dish, but get a letter. It's more of a Hanukkah dish, but it's basically steak and potatoes at this point. So what I call the, uh, the uh, old Kirstein family recipe, which is basically the recipe my wife uh, has been making for a couple years uh, that we figured out, uh, is two parts shredded potato, one part shredded onions. You could do it on a box grater, you could do it in a food processor. A little bit of salt, put it in a colander, and we put another bowl on top of that, and we usually put a can of tomatoes or something in there. And you let it sit for a couple hours so the juice really kind of gets out of it. Um, I like kind of a finer shred. Some people like more of a hash brown type thing, but uh, I, I do prefer the finer shred. So I always like to cook them in advance a little bit, otherwise they take forever. And uh, in the case of my wife, she ends up standing at the stove and being really upset with me for a couple hours when we do them. Um, see, that, that one didn't hit. That one. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I know. Uh, I mean, you know, listen, you got to remember, I eat bacon, so I'm Jew-ish, you know. <laughs> That one always kills. <laughs> uh, so uh, I usually, you can use clarified butter. Traditionally, you could use something like schmaltz, something like that. Uh, you know, I, oftentimes if I do this, I'll get the renderings. We even use the rendered beef fat, I think is a really nice way to do it. I think beef fat is probably the new, it's the new alt fat. When people are gonna start using beef fat like for everything. And I know like McDonald's used them in fries and they got in trouble for all that, but it'll make a comeback, I promise. Um, so if they're par cooked, it's almost like twice cooking a French fry. You'll be able to get them even crispier on the second second run. John, if you want to throw anything in here, you're <laughs> you're you're welcome to. I've got no jokes. You got no, well, they don't have to be jokes. <laughs> okay, all right. I got a palate. Uh, they're palate cleansers. Palate cleansers. You, the brisket reminds me. I asked you a question. If you know a recipe that comes out of the same tradition of which you cook, um, it's from Eli Evans. The the author, he wrote the book, The Lonely Days or Sundays and the Provincials, both about Jews in the South. Yeah, sure. And he was an advocate of Coca-Cola brisket. Yeah, but the problem is, is that Coke is not kosher for Passover. Unless you get the special Passover Coke. Which is the same as Mexican Coke. Right. Yeah. Um, and let me tell you, it's the only day of the year that I like watch any kind of food observancy right. is like Passover. I don't know why, I just feel obligated. So what does Mexican, I mean, what, what does Coke get you with a brisket though? Well, you know, it's going to be the same thing as kind of putting that brown sugar. You're going to get that uh -huh. caramelization. I think Coke has so many, um, you know, it's got so much flavor kind of on its own. Right. Um, that you get kind of that depth. I mean, it's like whenever you see somebody doing like Dr. Pepper short ribs, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's honestly a bit novelty, but, right. uh, but I think it's still cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can see, where's the camera? Big fatty brisket. It's beautiful. It's glistening. <laughs> it is. Uh, so yeah, so this guy cooked for about 12 hours uh, on pretty much strictly smoke. So it sat at about 250 degrees. Um, I look for about an internal temperature of around 190 to 210. Um, 
just like Elizabeth was saying, you know, barbecue is not about setting a timer. For me, it's about internal temperature, especially with beef, more than anything else. Um, so let's see here. I can plate one of these guys up. So a couple of latkes on a plate. And this is actually like, I mean, this is literally what we eat for a Passover Seder. I mean, we bring it around. Now, our Seders are really, really super, super reform in that, like, it's usually two or three Jews and, like, 14 Gentiles who want to see what it's all about. Um, they're, they're, usually, <laughs> they're usually pretty drawn to it, mainly, right. from, mainly from the standpoint that I'm like, you're going to have to drink a full bottle of wine just during the Seder. And they're like, wait, drink it? I'm like, yeah, it says it in the book. And like, <laughs> I'm like, you got to do what the book says. Uh, I got this guy. <laughs> I got him going. Um, so as I'm watching you slice this and I look at those two latkes over there, I'm thinking sandwich. Like, oh, yeah. Is that, I mean, is that, a, is that a possibility? Uh, it is a possibility. What we usually like to do is That's kinda, not a sandwich. That's, that, that's something else. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's a sandwich if you're a man about it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what we actually usually end up doing is we keep some of the brisket for the next day. Right. So that we could do that. It also makes really good hash, things uh -huh. like that. You fold in the hash, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean... But slice thin between two latkes... That's a yeah, you could sandwich. Do, you totally could do. I mean, you could do that. I mean, there's probably somebody from some uh, some company here who's going to steal that idea from you. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's your idea. I just I just saw it in a vision. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's steak and potatoes. I right. Mean, it's it's beef and beef and potatoes. Um, so then where's the harosa? Uh, so then, like I said, it's harosa. I mean, that's basically condiment. So you're thinking about smoked meat, mm -hmm. apples and nuts and raisins and all those kinds of things, honey. And so one big thing I kind of like to do that it's really exciting to me, it, you know, is the use of fresh horseradish on pretty much anything I can put it on. Right. You know, it's one of those flavors that's, you know, when you, most people are totally freaked out by it because they're used to, like, getting their nostrils flared up when they're eating oysters and that kind of thing. Right. But when you just put it on, like, you can get just a little more aroma out of it. And, and that right there is pretty much a Seder plate in a meal. And a meal that you actually would right. want to eat, I suppose. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, when I started kind of finding this identity and realizing that this was this is a tradition that's all over the world, but when you really focus it into the South and when you really find that, that the flavors and the ingredients and all those things are really, really conducive to, to the landscape of the South, it, right. it made me feel a lot more comfortable. You know, it made me feel a lot less uh, like I was forcing it. Because I would imagine right. that if you're in... Uh, you know, upstate New York, and you're trying to find walnuts or pecans, you might feel like you're forced to get a little bit more, right. you know. But this comes easy. Yeah, it comes easy. And I can pretty much go to the local farmer's markets and pick up every ingredient that I need for this at that farmer's market, you know. I mean, with the exception of wine, but that's about it. Do, do you find that, that Jews in the South who cook in this way – do, are they shopping the same way you are? Are they stepping into this notion? It's like, okay, I want my beef from Will Harris. I want my... So, so what's it, what I found really exciting about it is that's something that, you know, I've kind of gotten tasked with that. Uh, you know, the, the Jewish community in Atlanta is, um, is pretty tight, and they have a couple of little centers and things they do. And I actually right. get asked to come out and do cooking classes, things like that a lot. And when I tell them the, these places that they can get this stuff, when I tell them the opportunity to do that, when you show somebody who's been cooking a traditional Seder plate for 20 years and we're eating it 40 years before that, right. that they go, well, hell, I mean, we'll even do, you know, I'll do gefilte fish fritters, but we'll get catfish and we'll use matzo meal as the crust. And like, that's exciting for me. Like that's a, it's, it's not stuff out of a jar, you know? Right. That's a really elemental dish you've presented. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it's literally components from a plate. And when I started building those on the plate, at a Seder, everybody goes, what are you doing? Like, they don't understand right. why you're doing that, so. And how would that, if you were thinking about this, this theme of casual food and, and casual dining, how could that translate? If you took my idea of a sandwich, sure, sure. Are there, are there, what's the next dish? If, if the first dish is the brisket sandwich on latkes, what's the next well, dish? Well, I mean, I, so, like I said, I do gefilte fish fritters. You yep. know, that's the next step. It's, you know, because people don't want to eat the boiled cold fish. If it's a right. fritter in that capacity, that works, you know, when you're going through Passover friendly desserts, you know, right. before you know it, we're basically making meringues and pavlovas and things uh -huh. like that, which are, you know, you can buy a thing of meringues at the store and put some berries on it and call it a day. Uh, 
It's true, you know. I mean, it's, it's not yeah. it's not that far. I mean, technically, for Passover, divinity is kosher, and that's terrifying. But <laughs> that's a complicated sentence. Yeah, <laughs> divinity is kosher. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, but that that's what society. There's a lot of these traditional dishes, and it's not just like the Passover set. You know, I mean, a lot of these things that we talk about. I mean, even more Israeli type things like shakshuka is incredibly conducive to to the South. I mean, right. peppers and tomatoes and onions stewed together with farm eggs. I mean, that's that's a quintessential southern dish. Right. You uh, think about the connectivity between what you're describing, the food you're describing, and someone like Alain Shia at his restaurant, Shia in New yeah. Orleans, who's cooking those same sorts of foods and finds a way to be at once very much a representative of New Orleans, but also a, a representative of Israeli cooking. Yeah. It's and, an and, honest... And guys like Alain are really, are really exciting because they've been able to take hyper-authentic flavors and hyper-authentic techniques and get people to get excited about it because right. everybody's always loved euros and pitas and things like that but once you actually bring them to a more a more sincere more direct representation of what it is and not just slather with tzatziki right. or something and get people excited about that like that's that's fun and considering the bounty of the south and the ingredients right. you know that's that's a special kind of thing it's interesting to me as i listen to y'all and as we think about bringing this to a close that there're two things happening in the south and i would argue they're happening across the country too and it's one is a rediscovery of roots of from whence we came um, and i think about michael's cooking as a representation of that he's paying homage to the women who raised him and cooked for him um, and then at the same time we have southerners who are kind of forging a new path, saying that, yes, you know, I am of Kerala, India, and I'm also of the American South. Um, I come from a place that people think of as deeply Christian, but here I am a Jew um, cooking in the South and claiming this place, too. And those things can coexist. They're not, they don't cancel each other out. We can do both, and that shows, I think, in American cooking. It shows in American approaches to casual cooking, too that we can both explore kind of multicultural frontiers and dig back deep into the terroir from which we sprang. And these folks do that very well. And I thank them for that and for so many other things. Thank you all so much. And Eli, we got you a big ass smoker because we want our Hyde Park graduates to feel the love too. So, and also when you see that brisket, it, we would have rented you 30 smokers to get something like that if that's what you need. So, um, we are now parting ways for the evening. Um, breakfast is at 7.30 tomorrow back here and we will be starting with general session at 8. Have a wonderful evening. Don't indulge so, so much that you can't make it back here for breakfast, but still have a lot of fun. That was an unbelievable session. Oh, you can. Oh, thank you very much. Nice. It was fun. Thank Absolutely. You no, thank you. Hi, Chef William Kreiner from Rich Products. Today, let's talk about the classic flan. So this is our rich and easy flan mix. And I wanted to put a twist on the classic flan. Today I'm going to be making a beet flan with a gorgonzola ice cream, a rye and walnut crumble, some beet chips, and a little bit of garnish of gorgonzola in a balsamic gel. So over here I have two cups of our rich and easy flan mix. I'm going to put that in a pot and I'm going to reduce that by half. Now that my flan mix has been brought to a simmer and is reduced by half, I will add one cup of my beet juice to that mix. Now that my beet juice and my flan mix has been brought to a simmer, I can pour this into my sauce funnel. You can pour directly into any mold, but today I'm using a creme brulee dish. This will now be placed in a refrigerator until set. Now that our beet flan has set, we're going to plate this dish. We'll start our, off by some walnut crumble. We'll top that with a scoop of ice cream with pink peppercorns, balsamic jelly, garnish with a beet chip, 
a little bit of the gorgonzola cheese. And there you have it. Beet flan, gorgonzola ice cream, walnut and rye crumble, balsamic jelly, and gorgonzola cheese. Hi, Chef William from Rich Products. Today we're going to talk about the classics, reinvented. So when we think about quiche, uh, we think about a nice buttery, flaky crust, a nice creamy custard, and some ingredients on the inside. So what we're going to do today is we're going to put a, a little twist on that, and we're going to serve it in a, a half pint mason jar. So we're going to do a twist on quiche Lorraine, and we're going to start today by prepping our pint jars. So we're gonna spray each pint jar with some pan spray. We're gonna start by laying, layering our ingredients. Here we have some bacon, uh, some crisp bacon and sauteed onions, some Gruyere cheese, and some chives and our quick quiche mix. So we're gonna layer these in two stages. Our bacon and onions, a little bit of cheese, back to the bacon and onions again. We'll top that with a little bit more cheese. We'll take our quick quiche custard here, give that a good shake, we'll pour that directly over the top, about three quarters of the way up the jar. Give that a nice tap, we'll set that on a sheet tray. Next we'll, we are going to create a cobbler type crust for the top of it. So what I have here is one of our Rich's jumbo biscuit doughs. We're going to grate that from a frozen state. It's important that it stays frozen because you want a light, crisp topping and you don't want it to defrost and become a mess. So to this, I'm going to add a little bit more cheese, sprinkle it over the top. I'm going to pop this back into the freezer to get it nice and frozen. So now that this is nice and frozen, we'll top our quiche with this. I'll bake this in a 325 degree oven for about 20 minutes. Our quiche is ready to eat. We're going to garnish it with a little bit of chives. And there you have it, our quick quiche cobbler with bacon and onions. Here's an elegant twist on the classic carpaccio using watermelon. Watermelon pairs really well with savory flavors such as prosciutto and goat cheese, which are all used as a garnish in this dish. First I'm going to take a seedless red watermelon, I'm going to slice it about an inch thick and cut rounds out of it. Place those rounds into a vacuum sealer bag and vacuum seal at 99% until it's compressed. Take them out of the bag and then slice those rounds either using a very sharp thin knife or a mandolin into about four or six slices for each round. To plate the dish I'm going to take the thinly sliced watermelon and shingle it on a plate. On top of that I'm going to garnish it with pistachios, green onion, parsley leaves, mint leaves, some crumbled goat cheese, some Aleppo chili flake, or any chili flake may do, some flaked sea salt, and cracked black pepper. For the last savory note, and a splash of color on the carpaccio, I'm going to drizzle with basil oil. Serve chilled, and enjoy. This recipe and the others in this series are available at ciaprochef.com slash watermelon.
poke is a traditional dish from the islands of Hawaii. Here, I'm going to combine various types of watermelon, the yellow, red, seedless, and mini, and turn this poke into a really fun dish. First, take the yellow watermelon, cut three by three squares, place it in a vacuum sealer bag, and then compress it. This will squeeze out some of the juice and make it look a little bit more translucent. And then I'm going to combine it with some classic poke ingredients. Diced up tuna, nori seaweed, soy sauce, sesame oil, green onions, thinly sliced garlic cloves, ginger, of course macadamia nuts, and some black sesame seeds. All of this will get tossed together with the diced yellow compressed watermelon. Two sauces that I'm going to make to accompany the poke are a pickled mustard seed sauce where I'm going to combine some yellow mustard seeds, rice wine vinegar, some water, and a sweetened rice wine called mirin, and some sugar, and simmer those together for about 45 minutes until the mustard seeds swell and the liquid is highly reduced. The other sauce is a sriracha aioli. Add some sriracha to mayonnaise with a little bit of lemon juice and stir to combine. I've made some watermelon cups using Using the mini watermelons that I've peeled, quartered, and then scooped out the flesh. The peels have been trimmed and I'm going to put those on the plate, take my watermelon cup and fill it with the poke salad, top it with a bit of the mustard seed sauce and the sriracha aioli and some fried shallots. I hope you'll find this dish as fun to make as I did. This recipe and the others in this series are available at ciaprochef.com slash watermelon. I'm here in uh, Kaohsiung at yes. Guangyuan New Romian. Gangyuan. Gangyuan. That's what I said. And uh, they've been around here for what, 60 over years? Yes. And Kathy grew up with this place. It's an icon. They serve um, beef noodles somewhere between the Vietnamese pho style and the Teochew Gu Ba Kui Teo style. Um, it's not as beefy as the Teochews, but it's not as light as pho either, and it's just nice. And they reduce the beef sauce, they put it into a noodle, just with, with just a few slices of beef, and uh, when you mix it up, like I mix it up with a bit of garlic and chili and, and, and just a splash of soy sauce, it transforms. There's this thing about the beefiness of beef. <laughs> It goes so well with starch. Hamburgers, beef pasta, Hainanese beef noodles. There is a sort of a beef noodle or beef rice all over many parts in Asia. There are people who believe that uh, the beef should be heavy. Some who believe that the beef stock should be light. So here the beef is uh, very light. Uh. Yeah. Not very strong. Uh. Right. Look at, look at. Uh, wow. <laughs> it's very hard to get noodle texture like this. Like they hand make this, so gong da. My goodness. The meat comes fresh. Um, I'm told they don't even have a chiller back there. Fresh to the store, boom, and onto the pot. Can you see the tendons and fats? And yeah. Wow. Okay, I'm, I'm going to fire this up with a uh, blended garlic puree. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and some gunpowder. Wow. Can you? Hey, hey, hey. Singapore Lang Hong. Singapore Lang Hong. Now let's, uh, let's desecrate this. The whole thing, the, the, the garlic puree, yeah. the chili just uh, takes me home.
I, I watched you prepare the soup, yes. and then we also maybe talked a little bit. Yes. But there's some secrets behind. Yeah. The broth, and it's a, it's, a, it's actually a very long process. Yes. For the first day, we we roast the bone, and also some trimming of the beef because we serve the steak here, so we are we have a lot of the trimming. Uh, we roast it together, and then we cook uh, with the cold water. Start with the cold water and cook for one day, and that's for on the first stage. On the second day, we put the uh, carrots and the daikon into it, the whole carrot and daikon into it, and cook for the second day to keep some sweetness of the vegetables. And the third day, we just cook out all the aromatics like scallion, onions. We roast it quite hard and uh, preserve bean paste, uh, tomato paste. Uh, ginger and uh, some uh, Chinese herb. We roast it strongly, and then we put it back to the, to the broth. And then the other piece that you, you showed me, yeah, you use short ribs. Yes, short ribs. Which is very yes. expensive. Yes. And you also give a uh, a lot of yes. short, a lot of meat. Yes. So that, again, that's not as traditional, but yes. I, it's. I mean, it, it adds something to the dish. Yes, so. exactly. The other secret that you you were talking about is yes. is when you did the reheated the, the beef itself, you yes. caramelized it. Yes, caramelize it. So to yes. give another different texture flavor. element and yes. different flavor element. Yes. And then why don't you tell me about the tomato? We use the beef fat uh, to cook with some with some chili powder, Sichuan peppercorn to keep some flavor of the beef fat. We put on the, the tomato uh, to keep the instinct flavor of the beef itself. Are we ready to yes. try it? Please, I mean, please take in. Again, it, it, I mean, rich in color and yes. great beefy flavor. Beefy. Oh, it's, it's it's tremendous. Yes. And then when you have the garnish, so you have a little, we have a little yeah. bit of mustard greens. Yeah, that mustard we, we greens. Could eat, yes, add we in. can add in. Yes. Uh, you you need to stir into it, and uh, it will bring another level of the soupy flavor and to yes. it and yes. so on. Yes, it's fantastic. That's Thank all you. I can say. Thank is Thank you very much. It's rich. It's 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 beautiful, and and it, and. It, of course, what you really want, it tastes great. I appreciate you like it. So, thank you very much. Thank you.